Hi, yeah. Chris. How are you? I'm very well, Corey. It's absolutely lovely to see you. Um, it's great have... to see you too. <laughs> <laughs> you somehow you're always smiling, no matter <laughs> how dangerous, weird, crazy things are. Thank you for that. You don't, you don't, you don't see me in the other room crying afterwards, but we'll we'll leave that for the <laughs> other room. But um, so, Chris, this is week three of these conversations. How are you thinking about the people we should be speaking with? I mean, there are so many aspects to this, right? There's understanding the basic pandemic itself and all the, the science around that. There's the psychology that we're all going through, the mindset. And we've had speakers addressing both of these. And then I think increasingly the conversation is going to be, what now? How, how, do, we, how do we dig ourselves out of this? What's, what's the way forward? And uh, there's a couple of speakers this week fo focused on that. And I, I think it's... Um, these conversations are incredibly rich because um, I, I think one of the things that people have got growing consensus on is that step one, we kind of get, right? You, you, you right. shut things down, physically distance in whatever way you can. Different countries have gone about it slightly differently, but, but basically that quote flattens the curve. Ultimately, um, the number of cases, the number of infections slow, slows down. And um, but then what? Because you can't go back to life as normal when you're living at home completely. You could do some things, but 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 you can't. And so that that's that's what we're going to talk about today. Right. It feels really really hopeful to talk about some actions we can take besides just staying away from everybody else. So um, well, I guess I'll pass it over to you to introduce the speaker, and I will come back a little bit later to share some questions from our audience. Thanks so much, Corey. See you again in a bit. Thank you. And, and yes, if you if you know anyone out there who has has just got stuck on, but how do people get back to work? Um, what do we go? Where do we go from here? Um, those are the people who you should maybe invite them into this conversation right now because I think they're going to be really interested. Um, our speaker, our guest, is a professor at Harvard, Danielle Allen. She runs, uh, among other things, um, she runs an institute for ethics there, the Safra Institute. And, um, and so f fundamentally, she's thinking about the ethical questions about what's happening here. But she has pulled together an extraordinary multidisciplinary team of economists, business leaders, and others who have put together a plan. And I've, I've been obsessed with this whole thing and how, how we find our way out. This, this plan is as compelling a plan as I've seen anywhere. So let's dig into it. Without further ado, Daniel Allen, welcome here to TED Connects. Thank you, Chris. Uh, happy to be here. I'm really, really grateful to have the chance to have this conversation with you. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's so good. I've just enjoyed our conversation over the last couple of days. Um, that this is this is such a complex problem. Let's let's. What I kind of want to do is just go through it step by step to um see the logic of what it is that your your team are putting forward i mean first of all the um just the the, the problem itself of how we get the economy going again just talk about a bit about what's at stake there because sometimes this is framed as the economy who cares about the economy people's lives are at stake you know so let's just focus on that don't worry about the economy but it's not as simple as that i mean as an ethicist what's at stake if we don't restart the economy somehow but we have to recognize that we've actually faced two existential threats simultaneously. The first was to the public health system. If the virus had been allowed to unfold unimpeded, our public health systems would have collapsed, and that would have produced a whole legitimacy crisis for our public institutions. So, of course, we shut down. We had to do that. It was a necessary self-defense action. That has, however, um, really devastated the economy, and that is also an existential threat. We can't actually endure a closed economy over a duration of 12 to 18 months, nor can we really endure a situation where we don't know whether we might have another two to three months of extensive social distancing. So we really need a, an integrated strategy, one that recognizes both of these existential threats and finds a way to control the disease at the same time that we can keep the economy open. We call that combination of controlling the disease while keeping the economy open, pandemic resilience. We think that's what we should be aiming for. So people who aren't moved by the notion of the economy, capitalism, whatever, think instead about 
the, the millions and millions of jobs that are lost, the people who are desperate to make money, and I guess the, the lives that will be lost unless we solve this problem. Absolutely. I mean, the economy is one of the foundational pillars for a healthy society with opportunity and with justice. You can't have a just society either if you haven't secured a just and, and functioning economy that delivers well-being for people. So, and all we have to do is remember back to 2008 um, and think about the impacts on things like suicide and depression and so forth that flowed from that recession. So, the economy is a public health concern in the same way that the virus is a public health concern. Okay, so talk about why this is such an intractable problem. Um, people isolate in many countries in the world now. You're starting to see the cases flatten and, uh, in many cases, decrease. Um, it looks like, uh, whether it's happened now in your country or not, um, that, that will happen sooner or later. So why isn't that problem solved? We've, we've beaten the virus. Let's get back to work. That's a great question, and it really speaks to how new the experience for us is to encounter a novel virus. It just really hasn't happened to our society in a very, very long time. So we are what's called a susceptible population, meaning not any of us at the beginning of this had immunity. We were all susceptible to catching the disease. Um, for a society to be safe, it needs to have what's called herd immunity. You can achieve that through vaccination or through people getting the disease. But it takes 50 to 67 percent of the population to get the disease in order to achieve um, that level of protection. We don't expect a vaccine anytime in the next 12 months, possibly 18 months. So we have to recognize that that pathway is not open to us. And to get a sense of the magnitude of what it would mean to live through the disease to get to herd immunity, think about this. In Italy right now, um, they estimate that about 15 percent of the population has probably been exposed to the disease. So you'd have to go, you know, repeat what Italy's done three or you know more times to get to a place where you could reasonably think that there's herd immunity. And I think you can see that when you think of that picture, how destabilizing a process would be of just leaving things um, broadly open without disease controls. So the real trick is whether or not there's a substitute for social distancing as a method for controlling the disease. Right, so Italy, even with that 15 percent, has suffered at least 15,000 deaths. Some people argue that it's underreported by 50 percent there. It might be 30,000 deaths plus there. And as they come down the curve, there'll be more to come. Multiply yeah. that by, by five or six, say, for, for the bigger population size of the U.S. And you, it, 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 the herd immunity idea, per se, doesn't seem like a winning idea. I mean, that's a horrible uh, no. idea. It's, it's a horrible idea, exactly. Though. And we do have alternatives. That's the important thing. We actually do have a way of controlling the disease, um, minimizing loss of life, and reopening the economy. So that's the thing we should all be focusing on. And, and again, the initial problem is if you just let people start coming back, as soon as they gather again in reasonable numbers, the risk is that this highly infectious bug just takes off, off again. And, exactly. um, and, and, and so one scenario is that you have countries lurching from a little bit of activity here and then, then then suddenly it explodes again and everyone has to retreat. That that yep. does not seem attractive. That's that also just doesn't work. No, exactly. I mean we describe that as a freeze in place strategy for dealing this with this. That is you freeze and you shut down all activity and then that flattens the curve. If you open up again, then you have another peak, you have to freeze again and so forth. So you have this repeated process of freezing, which just does tremendous damage to the economy uh, over time. I mean the upfront damage is huge. But then there's never space to, to recover from it because of a great deal of uncertainty and repeated applications of economically ruinous um, social distancing. So and I think, you know, you're really um, pointing to the features of the disease that make this situation the problem that it is. And there are really two that people should focus on. One is the degree of infectiousness. This is a highly infectious virus. So the comparison to the Spanish flu is a reasonable one from the point of view of degree of infectious, infectiousness. And then the second really important point about the disease is that it's possible to be an asymptomatic carrier. That is, to be infectious, to carry the virus and never show any symptoms yourself. Current estimates are still imprecise, but people think that about 20 percent of virus carriers are asymptomatic. And that is really the thing that makes it so hard to control. People don't know they're sick and then they become disease vectors spreading it um, everywhere they go. Yes, indeed. So talk a bit, Danielle, about your thinking about how we might outwit this thing? So the alternative to social distancing as a strategy for controlling the disease is really massively ramped up, massively scaled up testing combined with individual quarantine. 
So we are going to continue to need individual quarantine for those who are positive carriers of the virus until such a point as we have gotten a vaccine. Um, now, what does that mean exactly? It means the, the, the standard quarantine that aligns with the incubation period. Um, 14 days is often what people talk about. In a conservative picture, you might say twice the incubation period length, 28 days for an individual quarantine. Um, and we need that quarantine for people who are symptomatic and for asymptomatic carriers of the virus. Now, the only way that you can actually run an individual quarantine as opposed to a collective quarantine regime is if you do massive testing. Um, we really need to make t testing, in a sense, universally available so that we can be testing broadly across the population. Um, there are ways to target testing, make it more efficient and so forth. But in principle, what one should imagine is really wide scale testing, tens of millions of tests a day connected with <clears throat> quarantine for those who test positive. <coughs> Excuse me. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> so weird. Anyone, anytime anyone coughs <laughs> today, you go, oh, God, you know, are you exactly. okay? <laughs> yeah, no, no, I'm sorry if I was frog in the throat. That's all it is. That's all it is. <laughs> um, um, so, so just to play out a thought experiment, if, if we had an infinite number of tests available and um, after, after the curve has flattened and cases have gone down, everyone came back to work, but everyone was tested every day, then what we think is that the, te the tests will show up positive at, at the same time or possibly even ahead of the time that people are uh, infectious, but certainly let's say at the same time, even regardless of whether they're symptomatic. And so you could, those people would immediately go, go back home and the rest of the population should be okay. We should be able to get work done in that thought e experiment, right? Right, in that thought experiment, exactly, yeah. <laughs> But the trouble is that, that that would mean doing whatever, 200 million like tests a day, which right, exactly. uh, is many, many orders of magnitude more than uh, we have and could even imagine wrapping up to. So you have a proposal, this is the ingenuity, the proposal of how to potentially administer tests in a way that's much more efficient. Talk a bit about that. Sure. So if you were going to use a purely random testing method uh, to control the disease, you could probably actually get away with testing everybody every two or three days. I'm just I'm playing along with your thought experiment here and bring the number down to 100 million tests a day. But even that is a magnitude um, that would take us multiple months to get to. Let's just say if we even wanted to try to do something like that. So the thing that you really need is smart testing. So rather than testing the population at random, what you use do is you use testing um, to identify people who are positive, and then you add to that um, contact tracing or contact warning. You can we think about it in both ways. And what this means is that once you know who's a positive test, you figure out who else has been exposed to that person over the previous two weeks, and they all get tested as well. So you start to identify a class of people who are higher probability of being infectious, um, and you test that group of people. So you, you move away from random testing, you target it through contact tracing or contact warning. Um, and then depending on the level of effectiveness of your contact tracing and contact warning testing or strategy, um, you can reduce the numbers. So on a moderately effective contact tracing um, regimen, you could imagine doing 20 million tests a day. Um, on a highly effective um, regime of contact tracing and testing or warning, um, you could get yourself down to the order of five to 10 million tests a day. And the, some countries in Asia seem to have pulled off a, a version of this strategy that uh, has, has been effective. But it requires one of two things, if I understand you right, Danielle. It requires either just this massively scaled up and potentially quite intrusive sort of m manual contact tracing where you have big teams who swoop into anyone who's, who's tested positive and try to unpack their complete recent social history. or Technology plays a role, and this is where it gets complicated because, um, you know, there, there are apps in some of the Asian countries, like China has an app which most people are, I think, required to carry, it's certainly in, in Wuhan and elsewhere, where, where um, it, it, it's very good at predicting whether someone may need quarantine and, it, and, and they will be required to do so. And so there are all these concerns about government control, government intrusion. Um, you, you, are in discussion about ways of doing some kind of technology that would be more acceptable in a democracy. And I'd, I'd love you to share what those are. Sure, no, happy to do that. So I think it's an important thing to say up front that the rates at which we would need to test uh, per capita 
are higher, much higher than Asian countries used because prevalence is much higher here. They caught it earlier. They had these tools built before the pandemic hit. As a consequence, they're able to control it with a lower per capita rate of testing than will be the case for us. We just have to accept that fact at this point and recognize that massively scaling up is specific to our situation because we weren't ready before it hit. Um, so then, yes, okay, if we're trying to do the smart testing, trying to use tools, what can you do? So we're actually open to manual testing in the plan that we've developed. I want to just say that. And I think the society, we have a big choice to make, whether what we want is a big core of manual contact tracers who are tracing people's um, histories and figuring out who they've been in contact with and who they've been exposed to, or if we want to try to use a technological system. The important thing is there are diversity of options within the technology space. So it's really important to recognize that places like Singapore and China have used highly centralized data systems for supporting this. And so what happens is you, know, you sort of, you carry your phone around and everybody's connected to a central data system. And then when somebody in the system has a positive test that gets put into the app and then their phone communicates to other phones that it's been in proximity with over the previous two weeks to alert people that they too need to get a test, okay? That's the basic concept that in China and Singapore, the data structure for doing this is highly centralized. There are, however, a lot of innovative apps under development right now that depend instead on a very privacy protective structure um, where the data lives on the individual user's phone and through a combination of an encryption and tokens, users of phones can communicate with other users of phones, but the data is not centralized. So in that regard, it becomes more of a peer-to-peer -peer sharing, um, a sort of concept of friends warn friends that they should probably go get tested. Um, then you will have a central repository of test data, but the truth is we already have that um, because all influenza tests, for example, already roll up into CDC and human health and services databases so that they can track influenza patterns every year. So tell me if I, if I understand this right, the, the, that you would carry on your phone an app that would, um, when you got, say, within six feet of another human carrying that app, the phones would exchange a, a Bluetooth to using Bluetooth technology. They, they they exchange a kind of token that says "Hi, we connected," but it's encrypted, um, and that is not communicated to a central server. That is on the phone. But right. if you, either of you, in the next week or two, test positive, your phone will be able to communicate to all the people which it's exchanged token with to say, "Uh oh." Um, someone who you were close to in the last two weeks has tested positive, you, you've got to isolate. That, that's basically how it works, and it's, it's, it's done that way. And, and then exactly. the, the data, and then after, after what, three or four weeks, the, the tokens can actually auto-delete. The data don't. expires, exactly, that's right. Because you only need the most recent two weeks information or data about where you've been and what other phones your phone has interacted with. Um, so that's right. the really key thing. All right. Do you want so, to so we'll, we'll we'll come back we'll come back to that in a minute. But let's let's see what uh, what our friends are asking online. Okay. Hi, hi, Danielle. Hi, da hi, Chris. Yeah, we've got a lot of great hi. questions. People are super interested in how this is all going to work. Um, there's a couple of questions I'm trying to kind of cobble together here. I think people are really interested in um, your thoughts on the United States healthcare system. We have so many underinsured and uninsured people, and the changes that you might make to that system, I mean, does that situation make things worse and what changes would you make um, to the system so that we're not as vulnerable in the future? So that's a great set of questions. And um, so just from the point of view of the testing program, um, it is absolutely critical that the testing be free. Um, and so there is absolutely a sort of necessary feature of this, which is about kind of universal access um, element to the health system. And so I'm sure there will be tweaking that's necessary in the existing health system to achieve that. Um, we've also, without any question, seen vulnerabilities that relate to and stem from our fragmented health system. So I think there's a much bigger, longer term question to be had about or conversation to have about how we overcome that fragmentation. So, yes, I do hope this moment will be a spur for that longer term conversation about improving our health system and really achieving that universal coverage um, that we so badly need. Okay, thank you. I'll see you both again in a little bit. Thanks, Corey. So, so yeah, so let, let, let's stay with this tech issue for a bit and the sort of civil rights or privacy questions that it might still 
um, raise in some people. So one, one, one concern is that surely if your phone is able to contact these other phones, someone somewhere is ultimately going to reverse that and will have some kind of record of your, you know, who everyone who you've connected with and that might be concerning to, to some. Is that a legitimate concern? I think it is. I mean, I think um, we've been working hard on this question and really trying to think it through. And when you talk to legal experts and civil liberties experts and so forth, everybody starts with the same premise. Assume failure. Assume that you'll have a data breach. Um, think for that and what kind of protection you want in that regard. And so when you think that way, um, you, of course, are trying to minimize any likelihood of that happening. So hence the privacy protective structure of phones communicating with phones, data living on the, the hard software of the, or the hardware of the phone, um, not um, in the server, et cetera. Um, and then also you would want a kind of democratic accountability feature. So for example, um, having the Department of Health and Human Services have an auditing function to audit um, the, the whoever is manning the server or uh, you know, controls the server through which the tokens are exchanged, you would want to audit their functionality and how they're using the data. But then again, you sort of presume failure that somebody's reverse engineering, the audit system fails in some fashion. What's your protection then? Um, and the answer to that would appear to be upfront legislation um, that prohibits the commercialization of this COVID testing data so that anybody who in any way tried to commercialize it in any kind of way would be subject to um, legal penalties. So I think that's how you sort of build the fence up up front and the expectation that somebody would find a way to crack it. And then there's a set of questions around how you get this app out there at scale, because it's only effective if, say, two thirds of the people who are working are carrying it, right? Something like that. And right. um, and so, short of you know, authority and everyone must have this app. Um, I guess that there there are ways that are interesting to say to people: one, this is a really useful app; it will alert you quickly if if you're at, mm. at any risk. But two. To get to the kind of scale we're talking about, you might have to say to people, look, we're slowly going to come back to work, industry by industry, company by company. Um, in the deal for you to come back and break isolation, the societal deal, is that you have to be willing to, to carry this up. And you could, for people who didn't want to do that, I guess you could have some protection. You can't lose your job for that. But, but I mean, can you picture society making the choice that it is reasonable to require people who want to come back to work to carry that alert technology with them? So this is the hardest question. Um, we know we don't want an authoritarian model such as the one used in China and Singapore. Um, so we have to figure out instead how to activate that thing which is sort of the most important democratic resource or asset, namely solidarity. So what is it that from a solidarity perspective, it's reasonable for us to ask of each other? That has to be the frame for deciding how we approach this. And so one aspect of this is really, truly the sort of building a culture of opting in to this. And there are examples of this. So, for example, New York has tackled HIV um, testing um, through a program goes by the label, you know, New York Knows. Um, and it started out with thing, labels like, you know, Manhattan Knows or Brooklyn Knows and so forth, sort of the different boroughs. And what this program is, is one that is owned by community organizations, community partners, um, that do the job of spreading the word and recruiting people into testing programs. And New York has the goal of having every single New Yorker be tested by for H HIV. So in other words, it's established as, a, as an expectation that universal participation, and it's activated a network of community partners and organizations to cultivate that commitment to solidarity. And so I think, in all honesty, that that would be a really huge part of what you would need to do in order to tap into solidarity to have this work um, I'm sure that we would see some amount of uh, requiring in different contexts. And I think that's a very hard one because you don't want to um, generate labor discrimination problems. Um, and so the model there to, to think about and to sort of figure out what are our parameters, what do we think is fair, connects to things that schools currently do, for example, when they require that students um, show vaccination um, proof before they can start the school year and things like that. And so there are multiple states that do that in schools for vaccines, um, would schools do the same thing? What's the sort of labor, the workforce question like? I think that is very much remains to be worked through, but it's a hugely important question. I'd be curious what the watching audience thinks about this. Maybe you could enter a comment on it. But I mean, is it reasonable in the, the world that we're in right now for a company, let's say, to say, look, we, we want to get back to work, but we want to do so and respect the safety of all our workers. That means that for you to come back to work, 
you need a test showing that you're you're negative, and you um, uh, and you need to carry this this app so that we can alert people quickly if there's a problem. Um, is that it, we won't fire you if you don't come in, but but if you want to come back to work, that's that's what you'll have to agree to. Is that a reasonable stance? I'm curious what people think. Um, is no, there I'm any other way to get? That, yeah, you know what people Sorry. think too. Yeah. Well, no, I, say, I mean, you know, again, there, there is precedent for this in the sense that drug testing works this way in many employment contexts, right? There are many roles where people have to do routine drug tests as a part of um, preserving their, their job. Um, that was a hotly debated issue in the 1980s. People sort of think back when that sort of first came in, and there was a lot of concern about it. Um, we have managed to develop a regime for that that um, has achieved an equilibrium of a kind. So. I imagine that something is possible in this space, but we would have to draw on the prior experience with things like drug testing in the workplace, I think. I mean, one, one problem that we face when you, when you think about these big systems introduced is that in the past, there's, there's history where something got introduced. You know, you think of the Patriot Act that came in after 9-11, and a lot of people have a lot of problems with that act, and it gets renewed relentlessly, relentlessly. Here we are nearly 20 years later. And, uh, and it's still with us. So that, that, that creates quite a high bar for any, any standard that we, we push out here, is that how, how, do we, how do we persuade people that this is custom-made for the current situation that we're in, and it's not going to be picked up and subsequently abused by companies or by government? That's an absolutely critical question. And I think um, we have a lot to learn from places like Germany. Um, which are really, really strong and rigorous on privacy protections, perhaps having some of the highest privacy protection standards in the world. Um, and Germany, over the course of the last few weeks, has articulated an approach that definitely picks up several of these elements. So um, there are ways of building in privacy structures that are meeting the standards of the German um, privacy framework. And so I think for us, that's a really important place to look to um, and learn from them how they're structuring it to achieve those privacy protections. Danielle, you're, you're an ethicist, among other things, as well as a political theorist. And uh, is it, as, as you think about how to apply ethical questions to this, is it inherent in a situation like this that there are going to be trade-offs, that there is no, quote, perfect solution, that we, we just, you know, these things are fundamentally, you've got two goods that are fundamentally in conflict with each other, or if you like, avoidance of two evils that are going to clash, and that uh, we, we're not going to, get away sort of untainted to some extent? We just have to try and make the least bad choice? Um, so that's, it's a, it's a great question. And I think um, I tend to formulate things as being about hard choices um, and judgments rather than being about trade-offs. I think trade-offs often suggest that you can precisely quantify uh, this degree of monetizable harm against that degree of monetizable harm. And I think that's actually not as helpful to us in this current moment, to be honest. Um, so, in, in effect, I think the most important thing is that we clarify our core values. Um, and so the way we've tried to articulate that is to say we have a fundamental value in securing public health. We have a fundamental value in securing a functioning, healthy economy. We have a fundamental value in securing civil liberties and justice and constitutional democracy. And so then the question is, given that set of fundamental values, what are the policy options that actually do secure all of those things? So in that regard, uh, at the end of the day, you know, there's a bunch of libertarians in the group that we work on. And a lot of us come out of a very strongly sort of privacy protecting, liberty protecting point of view. And so we're not here to sacrifice those things. We're rather here to find a solution that aligns with the values that we bring into this problem. So that's how we think about the decision making. Talk a bit more, actually, about the group that you've pulled together over this. I know that there's a TED speaker, Paul Romer, uh, an economist at Stanford, who, who's uh, I think a key member. Who, who who else is in the group? Well, Paul was a key member. I'm afraid we parted ways to some extent because he's advocating random testing, so the sort of um, hundred billion <laughs> uh, direction, and he's not a fan of the uh, contact tracing approach. So he does have, um, you know, he's sort of at one end of a kind of libertarian um, spectrum on that. And my view, however, is that yeah. testing 100 million a day is far more intrusive. Um, than smart testing supported by privacy protective contact tracing. Um, I also think it's really important to throw into the mix the fact that collective social distancing is a huge infringement on our civil liberties. We keep forgetting that. The alternative is not contact tracing versus nothing. It's contact tracing versus social distancing. 
we can't go out. We can't form associations where we get to be together in person. Churchgoers can't go to church right now. You know, political parties are having their conventions postponed. That, if that's not an infringement on civil liberties, I don't know what is. So from my point of view, the civil liberties conversation is one is about the contrast between the kind of infringement um, that is produced by social distancing versus um, the kind of um, in, you know, infringement or reshaping that would be imposed by a contact tracing regime. I didn't answer Maybe. your question. Moving so fast in real time. Talk, just talk about some of the other yeah. people who are in your in your group. Sure. So um, Glenn Weil, who's an economist at Microsoft, a political economist, is a really key figure, and he's really an innovative uh, mechanism design thinker who's really good at kind of figuring out how to craft um, incentive structures and so forth that um, help people uh, make choices in socially productive ways, um, in ways that are also freedom respecting and so forth. So um, he's really been helping us think about the design um, of the policy pathway. Um, Rajiv Sethi is another economist. Um, Lucas Danksik is a philosopher at Harvard who has been scrutinizing the civil liberties and justice questions. I mean, that is his line of work. Those are the things he's most um, committed to, and that's what he's doing. Um, we've reached out to a number of public health groups for regular consultations. Um, so they're not as directly part of our group in the sense of advancing a policy, but in terms of informing our epidemiolo epidemiological understanding, we've relied a lot on folks at the Chan um, School of Public Health at Harvard. Um, so lawyers as well, Glenn Cohen, who directs the Petrie Flom Center for Law and Bioethics has been a critical member. Andrew Crespo also at Harvard Law School, Rosa Brooks, Georgetown Law School. Um, I could go on, I'm mm -hmm. missing key political scientists. Actually, there's a great paper on solidarity by Melanie Kamet and Evan Lieberman that people should check out, too. Well, it's, it's exciting that uh, one of the impacts of this, and I've seen this in other areas as well, that this this crisis is, is really breaking a lot of cross-disciplinary lines and bringing people together in unexpected combinations, which is good. Yes. So, yes. how, if this plan got general acceptance, how, how I mean, obviously the clock is ticking, this is urgent. What, what would it look like to move this forward? Give a sense of what you think it would cost. Give a sense right. of how, who might own it. Like what, what would it take to actually activate this giant idea? All right, so it's a big price tag. So I hope you're sitting down. I'm glad you're sitting down. So over two years, um, based on conservative estimates of what you would need, that is say maximal estimates for testing and things like that, uh, it's got a price tag of 500 billion, um, which includes both the production of the tests um, and the personnel of test administration, contact tracing, and all of that. Um, so it's important to remember, though, that that production ramp up and the contact tracing ramp up are employment um, possibilities. So in that regard, they would counteract the uh, negative impact on employment of the social distancing. So it's a big price tag, but it would be multi-purpose in that regard. Jumping, you know, contributing to jumping up the economy as well as um, the testing program itself. Um, it would be important that it be phased in, and phasing it in would actually give us a way of testing out um, the paradigm as we went. So, for example, for a first phase of rollout, probably what you would want to do, um, ideally, though, by the end of the next month, um, would be to have a full range of testing for a combination of everybody in the healthcare uh, sector and everybody who might fill in and substitute for any healthcare workers who test positive. So in other words, your healthcare worker pool and a substitute pool, say a National Service Corps of folks who can fill in for healthcare workers who test positive. If you could get those two uh, groups, um, those two sectors, um, fully under a sort of testing contact tracing regime so that you know that every healthcare worker is not positive, um, and anybody who is is immediately quarantined and so forth, we would stabilize our public health infrastructure. And that would already get about 30% um, of the workforce under this um, kind of testing and tracing regime. And then you'd move on um, with that stabilized to other critical and essential workers, et cetera. So the bad news, Chris, is you know who would be the last people to be folded into this? be you, it would be me, it would be the people who can actually telecommute for work, okay? Because we would have the least call on social needs um, to pull us back out into the workforce. So we'd be the last ones um, out. Um, but that's a good thing. I think that's a part of making the point that we're all in this together um, and that there's a sa there's sacrifices at different places and service workers, care workers, and so forth would, would be able to get out faster. And, and that, that addresses what is definitely one of the most shocking and painful aspects of the current moment, which is, you know, for those of us in sort of working from home, it, it, it feels traumatic, but it's not nothing like what others are experiencing, whose, whose livelihood yes. depends on being out there doing exactly. you know, physical work. And um, 
And so it's, I think it's excellent, obviously, that the plan focuses on, on them first. How, how applicable is this to other countries? You're obviously talking the plan is developed for the, for the US. Um, yep. It's, it's inspired by what's happened in some ways, what's happened in some Asian countries. Is it applicable to other countries yes. as well? It absolutely is, and we're already seeing Europe move in this way. So Europe and the UK are ahead of the US on this point. I mean, the, the rough shape of the plan that we're proposing seems to be pretty much the rough shape of the plan that's emerging in Europe and the UK. So, um, you know, I think it's a really important moment to bring together those policy conversations, bring together those modeling conversations, and help each other out on this. And I guess that... that the reason I'm delighted that you're engaged in this is that it's it's it, you know it's fundamentally framed here as this is a discussion that society has to have. There are ethical choices we have to yes. make here as as part of this, and so yes. we can't just leave it up to it, the scientists as brilliant as they are uh, and and the politicians for goodness sake. Like we 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 all need to understand what is at stake here, what the choices are, what the hard choices are. And uh, yeah. I know that any direction is tricky, but we, we you know, that this, this, really, this really matters. Absolutely. Um, I think you've, you've put it so well. I think that's what makes this kind of question different in a democracy. It really is important that we all collectively achieve understanding, have clarity about the di directional options, and have a sense of collectively moving um, in a direction that we desire, right, that we, that we consent to, in a sense. Corey. Hi, I just wanted to come back and um, give you a little feedback on what people are saying online in terms of the testing um, to be able to go up back to work, you know, how people feel about that. Obviously, there's lots of questions about the app and privacy. Some people are hesitant about it. They're wondering, you know, whether it would be mandatory, which you touched on, um, you know, maybe you opt in to be able to go back in the office. I'm in. I would test to be able to go back in the office. <laughs> Um, myself, but I think people are wondering about that. But the general consensus is it seems like a reasonable possibility. Um, there are a couple of questions, too. One, I think you just touched on in terms of um, the global possibilities. Do you see um, some collaboration on the global uh, landscape? Do you see people talking to each other? Obviously, if we want international travel to come back, that seems like a key piece of it. Yes. So I think travel is one of the hardest pieces of this, and actually I don't think that there are good, clear answers on that yet. Um, scientists are talking to each other across international boundaries without any questions. I think the scientific community is really well networked, real connected, trying to think about these things. Um, it's not clear to me how well networked the policymaking community is, in all honesty. So I think that there's probably a lot of room for building a tighter international network of policymakers um, on that front. Um, and the hardest part is going to be the travel piece. And um, honestly, you know, we haven't even talked about parts of the globe um, like Africa or India, um, South America, um, where they're not yet, you know, sort of getting towards this policy paradigm. So the virus is going to live in the world without any question um, and live in the world probably in quite significant ways um, for a considerable period of time. So um, I think the role of travel restrictions is probably going to be with us for a spell. Um, and so it really does matter that we get the design of those right. Um, I think it's Hong Kong that has a particularly what looks to me like a sort of useful regime where um, anybody who's coming into Hong Kong for longer than two weeks um, has to go into 14 day quarantine when they arrive. Um, but for anybody who's coming for a shorter time, they have to be tested when they arrive and then they have to also go through active monitoring. Um, during the period of their time in Hong Kong, which means having temperature checks and so forth uh, reported. Um, so I think that's a reasonable thing to do in order to um, keep business travel um, up and running, um, even as we're all trying to deal with controlling the virus. And um, you also mentioned solidarity, and I think that touches on another question that someone brought up online about some of the social impacts after the 1918 um, epidemic and the fear and the, mm -hmm. um, you know, the fear of the other and um, foreigners and all that. And how do we get through this um, right. without that kind of fallout? And, you know, how do we kind of keep ourselves together and looking out for each other? I think that's such a hugely important question. And I mean, in one sense, it's easy because you know, the virus um, is an adversary to every human being equally, right? We're all completely equal in relationship um, to it. Um, and so what we are really all aspiring to here is 
um, sort of transformation of our basic um, socioeconomic infrastructure in a way that puts us all on a footing to be pandemic resilient. Um, so I have some, you know, I've been using the metaphor, we, we need to put ourselves on a war footing to mobilize the economy to fight the virus. And I stand by that in the sense that we do need to mobilize the economy and so forth. But really, at the end of the day, it's not a war against a human adversary or anything of that kind. And so what we're really talking about it goes back to the questions about the health infrastructure and healthcare. We're really talking about achieving a transformed peace situation um, where our economies and our societies are pandemic resilient. Um, that's the real goal here, and it really does require an investment. So because of the 2003 SARS experience, um, Asian nations have been investing over the last five years or plus um, in pandemic resilient um, equipment and infrastructure. We haven't done that in the U.S. So we find ourselves in a position where we have to accelerate in a matter of months something that has taken other people years uh, to build and develop. Um, so I think really focusing on that and the goal is an economy uh, that's not vulnerable uh, to pandemic, right? I mean, because we don't want to leave this pandemic and have the economy be just as vulnerable to pandemic at the end of the pandemic as we were at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, we don't want to be vulnerable this way. And so in that regard, you know, the job is to build in that infrastructure for pandemic resilience ASAP. Wow. Thank you. Danielle, the, um, you know, given um, the price tag you're talking about on this, uh, half, a, half a trillion dollars, basically, up to. Yeah. Um, that's admittedly less than some of the multi-trillion dollar numbers that are getting thrown around. So, I mean, in, the, in terms of the scale of the problem, it's, it's probably an appropriate number. But it sounds like it, to have any chance of doing this, this has to be a, a kind of a federal initiative at some level. Yes. So yes. we have a problem that more than half the country fundamentally doesn't trust um, key parts of the of the administration, let's say. How how could this be framed in a way that could build trust and make it make it feel like this is the country as a whole, that there's this coalition of trusted voices who are the final decision makers on this? So, you know, we have this incredible federalist system and we need to see it as an asset. It's modularized and flexible and we need to activate that. We do need all the parts of the system working. So we do need the federal government working um, on behalf of this. We need the state governments working and municipal governments. Um, on the federal end of things, we need Congress to fund. So in the first instance, there's a really big need for funding legislation. Um, and also Congress can really help by um, directing investments, not just in the testing program itself, but in a kind of national service corps, probably flowing through state governments, through the national, uh, through uh, the sort of reser not the reserves um, in every state, um, that would be sort of health um, reserves, you know, really expand that program, the accommodation of an employment program and, and backing up um, that sector. So there's a lot for Congress to do as a part of this. Um, for the testing program, we really do need the kind of procurement um, order to produce capacity that the Defense Department is the best um, example of. So in the ideal, um, a sort of testing supply board um, that brought in uh, leading figures who are masters of supply chain logistics um, from the private sector working in close coordination with the federal government would be great. Um, the, the, the White House has um, recently in the last week or so begun to put in pieces of an architecture that goes in this way, sort of a testing supply czar, for example, um, of an, admiral, an admiral, I believe. Um, so we need uh, people of that kind who are really superb uh, masters of logistics, procurement, contracts, and that sort of thing um, to be able to ramp up the, an active functional supply chain for testing to deliver um, at the order of tens of millions of tests a day. So mm -hmm. we do need the House absolutely as a key part of that, key driver of that. Um, and so you know, it's, a, it's a time for all the parts of our government to come together um, and do their respective pieces. So I'm kind of in awe at the scale at which you're thinking. I, I guess as we wrap up here, I'd, I'd, if I might, I'd love to just go, go to a bit more personal place. Like I'm just okay. curious about you, about you and, and what, what is it in your past that, that is sort of, is providing the fire right now, the drive to try to do this? How are you? How are you feeling about this? That, what, you know, oh, tell us a bit about you, please. Well, that's, that's a very generous question. Um, you know, I, it's like I love this country. Um, I'll admit that's where the you know motivation starts from, in the sense that like lots of people would say I'm a, a global humanitarian, and watching the world succumb to the disease motivates me. Like I think of Paul Farmer, for example, as an example of that. 
And I respect that and I get that, but I, at the end of the day, like I love my country and it hurt, just hurt in the beginning of this. And it, what hurt particularly was I was very clear early on that I was getting better information as a member of the Harvard faculty than my fellow parishioners, than the people who were serving me in restaurants and cafes. And it just like, that made me angry in all honesty. Um, and so it was a combination of those two things. I was like, A, I wanna understand this, and B, I wanna share what I understand because it's not fair that people like me get it and that's not being shared with other people. Hmm. Wow, that's powerful. I think all of us, Whitney, I'm like, we all feel this sort of weird mixture of almost guilt at how fortunate a position some of us are in. Certainly a lot of gratitude, anger. Um, were you persuaded, Whitney, by, by, this, by this idea, by the possibility of it? Sorry, you're meaning. Sorry, Whitney. Totally okay. Our names have been you know, hanging out here the last few weeks. Corey. Corey. That's absolutely fine. Right. Um, being mistaken for Whitney is a huge compliment. Um, it's very persuasive, and I think so hopeful to hear a constructive plan and a feeling that you know there is a path out of this that is both possible for us as humans to get back to being together, but then also as a, an economy and as a country. Um, I'm really inspired by your work and so grateful to you for sharing it with us. I appreciate that. Thank you. I'm really glad to get a chance to talk about it and, and share the knowledge that we, our group has acquired over the last month. So thank you. So if someone wants to keep in touch with the progress of this idea, what should they do? Okay, so now I should know our uh, website URL by heart, but of course I don't, I'm afraid. So um, if somebody Googles um, COVID, C-O-V-I-D, Safra, S-A-F-R-A, Allen, A-L-L-E-N, that's my surname, our website will come up. Um, so if you just remember those three words, COVID, Safra, Allen, and Google that, you should get to our white papers, um, op-eds, things like that. We are hoping uh, to have our full policy roadmap uh, published by the end of the week. Um, that's our target goal. So, Yeah, it's at ethics.harvard.edu. Okay. Um, so, exactly. That takes you to the main landing page and then to the COVID site. And then, yeah. and then go to COVID-19 from there. Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, th thank you so much, Danielle. I found this absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Like, it's going to take, it's going to take, um, I mean, this is not an ordinary idea. We don't often have someone come and say, yeah, I've got this idea for how to spend half a trillion dollars and um, <laughs> you know, between the U.S. and other places around the world actually getting the economy going again. That, that's not usual. So uh, this has been, okay. been a gift to us today. Thank you for that. And oh, thank I'll, you. To everyone listening, this, this is an important debate and uh, it's not finished yet. That the, There will be many other contributions to ideas like this, I think. And so, that's for sure. yeah, chip in, chip in, chip in. Thank you all so much for being part of this today. Um, we're back again tomorrow. Um, Corey, do you, have, do you have details on that? I do. And also, um, you can listen to this conversation um, on our website, TED.com, or on Facebook. And you can also um, listen to the recording it, uh, of it through TED Interview. So. Um, if you missed any parts of it or you want to pass it along to a friend. Uh, we have some more amazing speakers coming up. Um, I might glance at my cheat sheet, but tomorrow we have Esther Chu, who is a emergency physician and professor, and she's going to share with us what she's seen on the front lines of this crisis. On Wednesday, Chris and I will be speaking with Ray Dalio, the founder of Bridgewater, and he's going to address the market and economic implications of this pandemic. And on Thursday, we have two speakers, um, Gayatri Vasuvadan, who's going to share with us what's happening in India, and Fareed Zakaria, a journalist. Friday, we'll wrap things up with um, musician and artist Jacob Collier. So we have a lot of amazing things coming up. We do. So calendar it if you can. Apart from anything else, we just like your company here every day. So um, we'll, we'll get 
through this together. Thanks, thanks so much for being part of this. Danielle, thanks again. Thank, Thank you. you. Goodbye. Bye.